Welcome back everyone to Pencils and Lipstick. It is January 15th, 2024. I always have to look at my calendar as I say this to you guys. Today I have a wonderful guest. Her name is Susan DeFreitas. You can of course find her links in the show notes below, susandefreitas.com. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation and I think you're going to enjoy it as well, especially if you're around Susan in my age, which we'll just leave into like the 40-ish-ish. -ish. <laughs> uh, we have a really interesting conversation about what literature meant to people who were born in the 80s and grew up in the 80s and um, where internet was not something that, that permeated our lives as young children. It really came about when we were teenagers. The idea of what you could read and what you couldn't read. And then just Susan DeFreitas has way more education than me. She is, she is an amazing woman, um, has a lot of experience editing, and it, it's just really interesting to see how that has, that experience, both education and working, has led her to where she is now in her editing and book coaching. And what she says all the time and what's put on her website is that her mission is to tell stories that matter and help others do the same which is really great. And if you, as you go through 2024 and the guests that I've had, and I have not done this on purpose, but a lot of them are really like wrestling with this idea of writing the books that really matter to you and being really true to your own worldview as the author and putting forth a story that you think will change the world in your small way, right? We're one of 8 billion people-ish. So of course, we always sometimes feel like we can't change anything. But as you listen to this conversation and a couple more interviews coming up, you're going to hear that that if you get into it, if you allow that yourself to have this conversation, you can start seeing and believing again that even your book can have a big impact, right? And so Susan's work just centers around um, encouraging writers to write that story that it deeply resonates with them to make a difference in what they feel passionately about. So I think you're really going to enjoy this interview. Of course, Susan works with writers. And so if you, if she resonates with you, if that message resonates with you, I encourage you to check the links below. Susan DeFreitas, her last name is spelled D-E-F-R-E-I-T-A-S. Of course, the link is below, but in case you're listening and you kind of want to put that into your head and I encourage you to check her out and get on her newsletter and get to know her more, join the workshop that she talks about. We'll have that link below as well. So without further ado, let's meet Susan DeFreitas. Hello, welcome back everyone to Pencils and Lipstick. This is Kat Caldwell and I have a guest today. Her name is Susan DeFreitas and I am so excited to talk to her because I've seen her around in a lot of places and she always has great advice for all of us writers. So welcome Susan to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I am so glad to have you here. I've, I get, I've seen you like on so many workshops and different summits and things and you just like, you always have new and exciting things to teach us. Um, but before we go into that, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, I am an author, an editor, and a book coach. Um, I'm the author of a novel called Hot Season that won um, a gold Ippy Award for Best Fiction in the Mountain West. That was nice. I'm the editor of an anthology called Dispatches from Anares, uh, Tales in Tribute to Ursula K. Le Guin. And that was definitely a passion project because Le Guin was one of my all-time favorite authors. Um, I have been an editor and coach since, let's see, 2010. Oh, <laughs> so wow. that's okay. now. Uh, and I, I'm originally from a small town in Western Michigan, but I have lived most of my adult life in the West, and I currently divide my time between uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, and Portland, Oregon. Oh, well, that sounds fantastic. <laughs> well, I am from your neighboring state. I'm from Wisconsin, but yeah, 
haven't been there in a while. <laughs> oh, but New Mexico is amazing. Um, so you've done kind of like the full gambit of the writing journey, I say, but like, how, how did you get into writing in a novel? And like, why was, um, writing the novel and then getting into editing? How, how has that become your journey? You know, the writing thing goes very deep for me. Um, I am one of those people who started writing fiction just as soon as I was old enough to read it. And I was always working on the novel. And, uh, you know, it was all in notebooks and it was often illustrated in part. But I, as somebody who has worked with, with young writers, this is something I've seen with these kids. You have a big idea, you start writing your book, but you're growing so fast that by the time you're 30, 40 pages into it, you turn back to the beginning of the, the story and it's like, who is that baby? <laughs> right, was that right. person? So I didn't finish a novel until I was 11. And I'll tell you, you know, the reason I finally finished a novel uh, was because it was one of those horrible sixth grade, you know, social experiences where my best friend just decided that she was never going to get popular with me as her bestie. Oh, that was no. kind of dropping her stock, right? I know. I've talked to so many people whose sixth grade was one of the worst years the of their life. Year. So, <laughs> the worst year. And she turned everybody against me. I don't know what she said to this day, but I was suddenly alone at lunch, right? And I think we all come to writing for different reasons, but I return to that as a touchstone in my life, not, not to make it a big sob story or anything, but because I know that writing and the characters and the, the depth of the world of story and the depth of feeling of story was there for me at really the first big hard time in my life. Right. And that big hard time made me a writer. And in time since, you know, when I've gone through big hard times in my life, uh, so often it was being able to live inside a book, you know, big fat books. <laughs> I yes. like the, the bigger, the better when, when life sucks. I know a lot of us felt this during the pandemic too. You know, there's such a freedom Mm -hmm. in in fiction in the world of story and it just can take the pressure off of your real life for a moment so when people say accuse fiction of being escapist like that's a a detraction <laughs> yeah. you know why, why would we not want i, I don't mean, understand the insult <laughs> how is it not adaptive to be able yeah. to escape the world for a while so that right Right. That is really what made me a writer. I wound up attending um, a boarding school for the arts my senior year. This is the Interlock and the Arts Academy in Northern Michigan. It's widely known for classical music, but fantastic arts program there. And that absolutely set my course because okay. up to that point, on my parents' bookshelves, we had all my dad's science fiction and fantasy and those of you of a certain age will remember that there was a book club you could join where the first 10 books cost you a penny or something, but then they would send you a book every month. And if, and you, if, you, didn't, if you didn't want to pay for it, you had to send it back. And of course, who's going to remember to do that? So I, I grew up with, that's where all the Le Guin came from. That's where, you know, um, the the um, Bradbury, you know, um, I could go on and on about all the writers that I found that way, but Patricia McKillop, you, you know, CJ Cherry, um, and especially a lot of the science fiction and fantasy of the 80s, that was really mm -hmm. important. I read that. And then my mother's tastes were more literary, you know, so on her shelves, I wound up reading, you know, all of Toni Morrison, who was an absolute pillar of my high school reading, just opened my heart and mind in a way that still remains just foundational to who I am. Um, and, you know, Barbara Kingsolver and folks like that. 
So those two things kind of come together in in who I was as a writer before mm -hmm. I went to that school. But it was there at Interlochen that I discovered like really, I don't know, I guess you would say uh, what's considered like literary fiction, okay. you know? Okay. So I read my Hemingways and Faulkner's, but then also Italo Calvino and some Borges. And that opened my mind to how these two worlds can kind of go together mm -hmm. um, in terms of speculative fiction and literary fiction. And that's been a big part of my trajectory ever since. So that at least answers your question about my trajectory as a writer. As a writer, yeah. Well, what did you think, like when you look back, I look back at the 80s and 90s and I, you know, you you had the books, like you said, that were available to you, like Grandma's Bookshelf, um, Poldark, which like the tiniest print, <laughs> I remember that, like, and the Thornbirds, you know, like whatever Grandma had. Um, and I never thought that much about genre back then, because it was like, if you were a reader, you just read right so like these these uh, this idea of like literary fiction i mean i guess we knew classics i was like maybe they're dead <laughs> books right so how how did you feel about um genres back then were was that a thing to you at the point or was it just more about story you know it was absolutely just about story when i'm from a town of 2000 people that is the county seat which means every other town in the county is smaller than that. And I, as a child, I just read my way through the library. You know, I read up mysteries. I read, I dabbled a little bit in horror. I, you know, I, I read the Sweet Valley Highs. I read, you know, I remember those. Yeah. You know the, uh, the kind of deeper, more interesting stuff. I love Madeline Langle. I, again, I love Le Guin. Um, but like even working my way like through the romances probably at a inappropriately young age you know to me it was absolutely all just story and i i bring that sense of genre agnosticism to my work in in opposition to snobbiness mm -hmm. right i i find it you know really distasteful for anyone to give anyone else any grief about their tastes in reading they are reading right. like who cares right and sure yeah the, you know the da vinci code is horribly written but what is the pacing on that book mm -hmm. how is that story arousing curiosity where is it delivering the dopamine it's a master class in right. keeping people reading via curiosity right so there's always something in every story and i think yeah, people who are snobby about romances because they're into literary fiction, they would be shocked to learn at the depth of character development in so many, you know, yeah. those stories. Um, and I'm sure the I learned a lot. And 80s ones, like, oh my gosh. Right. And, and I'm sure I learned a lot about history via historical bodice rippers as a yes. kid, right? Because yes. Yes. You keep going through them. But and setting, like, they, they used to yeah. write setting. I have. You know, I mean, I think we s somehow have lost that a little bit in our um, snobbiness these days. Like, mm -hmm. it, it just seems to be so prevalent these days of what genre is it? I mean, don't you think Toni Morrison, if she were to, like, appear today, be like, well, you must be speculative fiction, possibly more literary, uh, dabbling in the fantasy. Like, <laughs> you're just like, it's I'll a good market book. Market women's fiction. I'll no. Market right. women's fiction. Um. But at the same time, I have to say, there is something I discovered at Interlochen mm -hmm. that was a literature at a level that I had not, if I had read it, I had not been aware of what it was doing, right? Okay. And to me, it's like, you know, you're playing a chord, there's, an, there's like a harmonic, there's another level that it is possible to hit that is eerie magical beautiful tricky right um and that's the sort of thing that i began to under it it expanded my idea of what was possible Ooh, okay read the short stories of john barth 
you know, it, it expanded my idea of what was possible in seeing the intricate ways that stories could be connected, like somebody like Alice Munro, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, where it, it, I I see it a little bit and we all have our differences opinion with our parents. You know, my mother's a great reader, but, you know, she doesn't like what she doesn't like. And she's not very patient with things that don't immediately mm. suit her tastes. And I feel like what I got during that year at Interlochen was the understanding that there are riches to be had in things that you don't understand right at first, right? Oh, I like that, yeah. You know, something like Gravity's Rainbow. When I read Thomas Pynchon, I was like, how is that possible? You know, and it's that same sort of understanding that later on I'm going to take to a book like Cloud Atlas by David Mitchell and see this intricate way that everything echoes each in is carried through you know or the way that um you know trust by Ernan Diaz mm -hmm. you know those sorts of books they reward a little more effort and uh they reward rereading re as well right so right. something yeah. about these books that are constructed in this way that they they can hold up a bit over time because not all of their riches are spent or or consumed let's say in in the first reading or the first sitting and they lend themselves that's to conversation yeah. you know and that's part of their value to the culture oh i like that you're making me think like that that's a really nice way to put it um so i i would assume too that your your vast like reading plus learning sort of the differences and not having that sloppiness has probably benefited you quite a bit and then becoming an editor and working with writers because while you can appreciate the science fiction you can also appreciate the the story that you must be a little more patient with and maybe like <laughs> you're not going to just be tossing it aside as a bored reader right um when it's your client and you have to you have to kind of like the book that you're editing you know like it's not fair to the writer if you aren't willing to like it <laughs> i would say like yeah and you know one of the things i have gotten from my clients from the very beginning mm -hmm. is that they've had previous experiences with feedback whether it was an um, an independent editor that they were hiring or a mentor mm -hmm. in school where that person or or even critique partners where the feedback that they were getting was essentially somebody attempting to overlay their vision mm -hmm. for the book and their tastes you know which can extend to such granular issues as how much backstory to include or how much exposition to include or how much interiority to include, you know, sometimes people offering their feedback, they might be great writers, you know, they themselves, and they may be genuinely well-intentioned and, and good-hearted, but they are attempting to overlay their vision for your book on onto yours, right? Or they're to enforce their tastes as if there's only one way to do things. Right. And, and that is something that from the beginning, I deeply knew that there was not just one way to do things. Right. Because, you know, I, I loved the, the most <laughs> commercial right. of work and seen its power. And then also the most top shelf, right? Mm -hmm. So what you know, these sort of guiding questions, what sort of thing are you trying to do? What type of story are you trying to tell? What other types of stories is it in conversation with? What is the tone that you're going for? It's almost like, you know, when you're listening to the beginning singer, you're you're not trying to, to get them to sing like you. Right. And- and it's not as if they are in the place where they have fully tuned in what their voice sounds like 
or what songs they like to sing, but you're listening for what they're trying to do and what their native uh, uh, capabilities might be. And right. then if you're a good mentor, if you're a, a good critique partner, if you're a good teacher, you help them bring, you know, amplify the things that they're doing well, and then bring the things that they're not doing well into consistency right, with that. Right. Yeah. Do you, do you feel like if you've been in, so you've been writing for decades, but you've been in editing since 2010. Yeah. So have you seen a difference in the, the way that we seem to be approaching writing? Like you live in America where we tend to really be busy <laughs> and like some, for some reason really want to do everything faster. I don't know why. And then with the Kindle, and I think the Kindle and self-publishing has opened up a lot of doors, um, mm -hmm. especially to people who did not have access to publishing before. And I think it's it's great to have a lot of books, but I don't know about you, but I feel this like weird pressure to put out more books, more, more than the book you want to write maybe? Like, have you seen a difference in, in editing and in like how writers approach writing in the last 13 years? You know, what I have seen is that um, the people who are still focused on what used to be the goal for everyone, which is to make a living via selling books, they are being forced whether it is um, their natural tendency to do so or not to produce more titles mm. because that is what the data tells us, right? right. It's that um, you need that backlist. You need, it, it's like, you know, binging a TV show. If you, if you get them with one book, you want to be able, you know, them to, right, keep. Right. and certainly, um, the ebook uh, readers that is working very much on the streaming model, instant gratification, you know, where you don't have to go to your bookstore. You don't even have to wait for Amazon to deliver your paper back via drone. Right. right. It's so <laughs> instant. It's just right there. Yeah. And I think that that does lend itself to an economics based on many titles. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I think we've seen, you know, people write for different reasons. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, even among people who really do strive to be writers first and to make a living via that, so many of them are, you know, either making the bulk of their uh, wages via teaching, mm -hmm. uh, in the academic system or outside the academic system. And, you know, I am a founding coach with, um, Jenny Nash's author accelerator program, which is the first uh, certification program for book coaches. And it's been really interesting to see, uh, how, as that program has evolved, the types of people who come into it right? Okay. Because we're all readers first. Yeah. And um, some of us decide that, you know, writing is really a passion and something we, we want to pursue wholeheartedly, but have to find a way to make a living. Being a to book eat. coach and a writer can be, you know, but then I've also seen people come through that program who you know, might otherwise have wound up as literary agents or okay. librarians or booksellers, or there's some combination of those things. So it's just, it's interesting to me, um, the way we're all finding our way yeah. into our, our literary lives, how that keeps changing, Yeah, you know, and I, many people, writers offering um, their own courses, their own you know, little critique groups there. Many of us have moved outside the idea that we're going to teach via academia right? Um, as a way to make a living. 
And I kind of love that because I think there are some definite problems <laughs> with uh, the creative writing academic world that I have explored in detail by having a lot of education in that world. Well, you're kind of limited. I mean, the wonderful thing about the internet and how it's exploded over the, you know, last two decades, I guess, is you're, you're exposed and you can find, like I can find someone like you it, when I went to college and was trying to, on the side, take some writing classes unbeknownst yeah. to my parents because they didn't want me to do that. Like you only have the professor, right? I mean, it's the late nineties, early 2000s. You're just like, and whatever their opinion was, like I was young enough to be like, well, I must, it must be that, <laughs> you know, like yep. that's yep. how you write. That's how you, cause I so desperately wanted to be a novelist. So the internet is wonderful that we get to do that. Uh, we get to find other people and other voices, but at the same time, we have to like wade through them. So how, like, how did you go into, like get into helping other writers by editing? Because I mean, not, while a lot of writers do that now, I. I feel like that's almost a, maybe I feel like it's a new phenomenon, but not every writer wants to do that. Like not every writer wants to edit, right. And take on that responsibility of, of helping yeah. a writer make this, this thing that they have in their head exactly on paper. So how did you get into it? Yeah. So, um, I, uh, was in my second year of grad school. I did my MFA at Pacific university and a, a woman from the Portland literary community had come to, this is a low residency program. So she came in to give a presentation at one of our residencies and she owned and still owns um, an editing and now book design agency based in Portland called Indigo. And she heard me, uh, this is just the most bizarre fluke. And you, it, I mean, you have to laugh given where all this led in my life, but she saw me read poetry and it's a, a poem I never published, <laughs> not for lack of trying. I'm a, I'm at different times in my life. I've been more serious about poetry, I guess, than I am now. Um, although I was studying fiction at the time. Anyways, she saw me read that and she said, oh, I'm looking for somebody um, to join my agency as a contractor to edit poetry because nobody at Indigo knows how, has knows their way around that. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, let's like meet for lunch. And, uh, but at the same, like in the back of my mind, I was like, it's not really even my thing. And it's not what I went to school for, but like, but hey, I'm, job. <laughs> I'm an entrepreneur. I have always like, you know, all through my twenties, I was doing all sorts of different gigs uh, to support my creative writing habits. So right. I was like, okay, here it is. This is the next thing for me in Portland. But I sat down um, to have lunch with her and, you know, immediately proceeded to sell her on, um, uh, how I could edit literary fiction, how that was my background too. And I could see from her reaction that she already had folks with that background. Mm -hmm. And I was, it was like almost as we were getting up and I was like, and if you ever need anyone to edit like fantasy and sci-fi, like I love that stuff. And she was like, oh really? Right. And in the entire time I was with Indigo, it was maybe nine years. I think I edited one book of poetry but science fiction and fantasy became my bread and butter, right? Okay. And I loved helping people with that. And Indigo was such a, a beautiful opportunity. I'm eternally grateful to Ali Shaw um, for giving me that opportunity because I learned a trade, mm -hmm. right? I had an education and I've always had, you know, lots of strong opinions about writing. <laughs> Hopefully well-founded, you know, but learning editing as a trade, learning the Chicago manual of style, you know, right. learning why the commas go where they go yeah. and how a book is laid out and what are the phases that a book goes through at a publisher. It mm -hmm. gave me a new understanding of what every book I had ever held in my hands had actually gone through. You always right. think, 
oh, it's just the author wrote it that way. That's almost never the case. Although sometimes right. it is the case with self-published books now. Usually, usually you can tell though. When usually you right. can tell, right? So it was a real education in publishing and it was a really wonderful opportunity to work with people in shaping their work. I started off developmental line editing and proofreading. I eventually moved to just um, developmental by the time that I left there, because again, that's what I went to school for. Okay. Um, and it's what my my real joy is yeah. in. Could you um, tell us as as the the listeners are mostly writers here, but could you tell us like what the, like a glimpse into what that looks like because as you said most writers are like oh i have my first draft and we always kind of cross our fingers that it's pretty good <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. and i feel like these days the first draft or maybe the second goes off to some editor that they found on instagram and i mean that's like unfortunately that's kind of what life has been become yeah. you know like you don't really know your editor or whatever so um what could it be like and what 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 did you see as the way that these um the books that came in and then went out like what was that process just a, a little glimpse hmm. um well let's the agency that i worked for was built to approximate for authors themselves the same process that they would go through with a traditional publisher okay right and that was by design because that agency also works directly for traditional publishers okay right? um and sometimes the people the authors that we work directly with um they wanted to improve their manuscript and get it in shape um to submit for traditional publishing Okay. But increasingly over the years that I've worked with them, you know, a good portion of the writers were headed towards self-publishing and they were smart enough to know that they shouldn't just slap it up on, you know, on Amazon without yes. going through this sort of process that nobody unrelated to them would want to read it if they did it that way. Uh, so, you know, those stages are number one, a developmental Edit, okay. right this um is i mean there's two versions actually of, of a developmental feedback right and the first version is usually just an editorial letter that's big <laughs> um editorial letter so what the first stage is an editorial yeah first stage is a big picture editorial letter you know on plot characters pacing um that kind of big picture feedback on the story itself okay round two is more detailed developmental editing where you're working on tightening up scenes you're working on does this whole paragraph need to be there how about the end of this chapter seems like it could be stronger better focus on questions or tension or whatever and let's you know this ending i think you know might require this finesse in order to work okay. and sometimes that's about actually deepening um things that are working well too for better impact then uh and and each one of these stages, it goes back to the author, right? Right, right. Revision and incorporating the feedback. And then there's a line edit, which is all about tightening up the prose. Different people, different line editors have different approaches there. You know, because of the background I come from, when I give detailed edits of this sort, I'm very clear about, you know, these two sentences say basically the same thing. I think you need to cut one of them. That's more than, I guess it's called substantive editing, right? 
It's more than there are editors who will only, you know, apply the rules of the Chicago Manual of Style and ask a few questions here and there. Oh. And then there are, are ones more like me who are like, let's improve your prose style. Yeah. Let's re- eliminate redundancies. Let's get rid of your mushy words. Let's cut down your word count, right? Yeah. And then the proofread, you know, that is purely mechanical editing, applying rules. But then even, you know, after that, there's there's the final, which is when the book is laid out, because there can be errors introduced in formatting, right? Does this chapter beginning even look like the same as chapter, the next chapter's beginning, right? And you check for things called widows and orphans, which are fun, you know, publishing terms, but that's the whole ride. That's a lot. That's a a lot lot more than most, I would say most indie authors do. A, money-wise, B, trusting somebody to- to do that so so you have all that background you worked as both both types of editors i yeah i did all of that and uh there came a point where i realized it was not good for my mental health or constitution uh for me to be a proofread reader i don't i i'm not the person that's just there to apply rules and i never want the last line of defense on a on a published book that's for people who i'm a naturally a big picture person yeah yeah well, that's okay. We we all have our our you know boundaries. Right? <laughs> I would not want to be that person either. It's funny though because more and more, even traditionally published books, you find at least one error, and it always gives me like warms my heart because <laughs> they're big, human. Yeah, those big typos, man. They're crazy. So then, after nine years, like, is that when you did you leave to become a coach, or did you? No, I. And my work with Indigo was always on a contract basis. So I was always, you know, bringing in my own clients as well. And, but there came a point in that process, you know, where I was, I was well established as an editor. Um, and I had a good base of clients and I had published my first book, um, which was part of having uh, a higher profile, let's say, Mm -hmm. around um, uh, bringing in clients. So it wasn't the, it it wasn't that I was hungry for work, let's say this. It was that I was really frustrated at the quality of the stories that people were bringing to me. And I don't say that in a snobby way. You know, I say that in a way that is genuinely frustrated for the writer, Mm -hmm. you know, that they spent so long, you know, sometimes I say it's like running for a thousand miles in the wrong direction. There's to, to have such manuscripts brought to me and attempt to, to help these people make these books, what they wanted them to be. It was, it felt like a Herculean task. And it was one I was asked to do over and over again. And, you know, it's a saying in the editing industry that editing can only make a manuscript about 10% better, 20 at the, at the top. That was never enough for me. Right. Because when I first went to grad school, I thought I was going to teach college, right? This is... (laughs) And luckily that didn't work out. Things went in a different direction because, you know, sort of the bottom started to fall out of higher ed around that time too. Out of all the friends who went to grad school because they wanted to teach college, you know, less than a 10th of them wound up doing so. Oh man. Right. Because it it became so competitive. Okay. And, um, you know, the, the thing where colleges just exploit adjuncts, you never, even with a PhD, you never get right. beyond. I have a few of those friends that that's very frustrating. And you can't make a living working for just one school, et cetera. Right. So right. I feel like I dodged a bullet there, but I always had that thing in me that I wanted to teach. I wanted to like help people learn the craft. I didn't want to just help them try to fix their cake wrecks, yeah. you know? Yes. Yes. And, and, um, So, and also I'm a very relational person. I'm a very, you know, 
I, that's part of what makes me naturally a teacher is that I'm I'm very much about let me relate to this person, find out what they need, and then let's see if I can communicate that in a way that will specifically help them. Okay. And I'm not afraid of the of of the personal intimate side of writing, not at all, right? right, right. And there are lots of people who don't want anything to do with that messy, you know, side of the writing process and they just want to work on the book itself, mm. you know. Um I'm not that person. So I was I had arrived at a point where I was feeling kind of frustrated. I was feeling the point where I'd sort of hit the ceiling in terms of, you know, what I could do for people and also how much of my own native abilities I was using, right? Right. Let's say my self-actualization in terms of career. And so when I met Jenny Nash, which was right around the same time I won an award for my first book, it was all at the same conference. So it was one of those like plot twist weekends, right? (laughs) Change your whole life. Um, you know, I knew immediately that I wanted, I I wanted to be her when I grew up, right? Yeah. And it, it was in the, in this industry, it's not that obvious. I've always been very good with um, female mentors and older role models. If I can see another woman doing it, I can I can I can do it too. I can feel like right. I can do it too. But in the absence of that, you know, it it was really hard to figure out where to go. So Jenny changed my life there and she gave me a very different business model. One where you work with the writer as they are writing or revising their book, right? Right, right. So I always start with big picture, whether I, I read the whole book that they have written and give them chapter notes and then we develop a revision plan. Or we just work on outlining via a special process that I've developed, um, which is uh, I've encapsulated in a course of mine called Anatomy of the Novel, it's a different approach than um, than anyone I've seen out there. And then from there, you know, via book coaching deadlines, they send me 25 pages at a time, starting on page one. Mm -hmm. And for every 25 page submission, I respond with big picture feedback via an email and then detailed editing, a combination of developmental and line editing or whatever they need, depending on what stage they're at on the, on the pages themselves. And then the important part is we have a conversation about it. Right. Right. This, This is key for anyone who hasn't yet gotten the editing process. I don't know about you, but I have found editors who then I would contact and said, okay, um, can we have a conversation? No. Yeah. The price that you paid, the fee was in my line edits, that's it, whatever. He like, okay. <laughs> I'm learning as I go for all. Yeah. yeah. And um, again, there are plenty of folks who are, who are very good in this industry, who that's their skill set is just mm-hmm you know, responding to what's on the page and you can take it or leave it. That's not their problem. But when, you know, as an editor, I learned what it takes to improve a manuscript, right. And bring it to publication. But as a book coach, what I really learned is what it takes to help someone improve their skill set to progress as a writer. And you cannot do that in the absence of these sorts of conversations. I need to understand from what I wrote, what are you hearing? What do you understand? And then also there's some important disambiguation there where, you know, especially if if you're the sort who, who feels a lot of sting when you get feedback on your work, it can all just kind of occupy the same sort of white noise, you know, feedback uh, sort of situation, or you've just highlighted the one thing that's a problem and you're not hearing any of the praise. Right. Right, right, right. But in those conversations, I'm able to say, you know, so I don't know if it's, I, I, I hope it's clear from my feedback, but if not, the mm-hmm. thing that I'd like to impress upon you is that the most important thing is this. Right. 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 And right. when I'm talking about the most important thing, I am generally talking about, this is the core skill 
that I want you to a understand what I'm talking about, what I'm asking you to do, and b I need to see you demonstrate that you can do it, mm. right? Because that's what it's going to take to get your book to execute the book the way that you imagine. Right, so right. That's the book coaching journey there. I think that's an amazing distinction and a reason why, like, why a writer would choose to work with a book coach like a lot of writers ask me the difference between them and they ask me you know to maybe how to find an editor how to find you know and like why they would need a book coach and if you really want to be the kind of writer that will continue the evolution of your writing and get better and better each time you have to have a mentor i mean you can read all the books i got all the books here yeah. <laughs> you oh, know yeah. You can do some courses, but at some point you, you have to be really hungry for that mentorship and that being open to somebody else's thoughts and ideas and brainstorming. And like you said, also being that person being open to what you're trying to say as well. And having that conversation is actually what's going to help your brain go, oh, this is what I need to do. Like so many writers try to be alone and do it and then send off their manuscript and then they get frustrated and there's tons of stories out there of how they stopped writing because this editor said this and i i find that just heartbreaking because eight yeah. that's not how it used to be you know yeah. like fitzgerald did not have an editor where he sent off an entire manuscript it was a relationship it was sending mm -hmm. pages mm -hmm. like you have with your clients and getting feedback and asking him to put something green in every room or something. I can't something remember. Something like that. No. Yeah. <laughs> you know, giving them, but it was from the bigger picture to the smaller picture and making sure like his characters are so distinct, not because he is a genius, which he is, but at the same time, he had somebody else's eyes in the conversations constantly. Mm -hmm. So like, what can you do even better? Like, I don't know why we're, why, I don't know that we're opposed to mentorship or like why it's, it's still somehow a blockage in this industry. Mm -hmm. You know, there are genius writers in history who wrote in isolation, you know, um, it's not as if those people don't exist, mm -hmm. but I think what you're saying is so true, you know, that those people are the exception right. and it's, you know, why hire a, a book coach? Like it's quite expensive to work with a book coach. It takes a lot of our time mm -hmm. to, to engage in this close relationship over the span of time that it takes to write a book, right? right? And it takes a lot of education and experience for someone like me to be able to provide the sort of feedback that I do, right? right. Not only helping to steer your particular project, towards the best possible version of itself. And that's often like bearing the end in mind, right? Bearing the big picture in mind, which right. is very hard as an individual writer to do when you're down in the weeds trying to figure out how to make this freaking scene work, right? Yes. <laughs> now you're not thinking about your end game with the story. Right. But then also to be systematically guiding the writer towards the core skills that they need in order to not have to hire us for another book, right? right? But that then is part of what has led to my next evolution. Yeah, as somebody, um, yeah, who is teaches a lot and yeah. teaches a lot of uh, uh, offers self paced courses because you know, what I began to see, and this is not true of every um, coaching client by any means, but part of what I was seeing is that people were, were loved the way that my feedback would help them improve um, these individual sections of their novel and the way in the end, it allowed them to produce a, a first draft or a second that is way more like a fifth draft, right? right Much more right. Long, the way that it helped them to save time. Yeah. And they're absorbing what I would say on the phone 
and the way that I was basically steering or directing them. You know, people say that after working with me, they've developed like a mini Susan that like lives in their head. <laughs> so when they're trying to get away with something mushy or like half baked or, you know, it's the because voice. Our brains will try, right? <laughs> right, right. Because it'd be easier. They're like, okay, no, I'm, I won't do that. But what I would see is that some of these folks, especially, they were not necessarily getting the why behind what I was behind my feedback, why these are the core skills that you need to develop, why I'm pushing you to play out this conflict further okay. in this key scene and not go, you know, and particularly in a way that they could apply to their next book. Okay. Right. right. Because without actually understanding the framework behind the feedback that you're receiving, you're sort of just getting it on osmosis. And and that is yeah. the way apprenticeship used to work in the arts, right? But I really feel like it's a bigger service um, for me, at least. I I am also a pretty analytical person. I like to know why things work. Yeah. And um and and not just to feel like, well, it worked. Cool. Right. Which I you know, I'm gonna do it because that's what Susan would say to do. Yeah. You know? Um in, in understanding the why is gonna sustain you over more books, I would say, because absolutely maybe they could write the next one with the, the little Susan in their head, but eventually, like life gets busy, things happen, your osmosis falls away yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. they need to know why we all need to know why the da vinci code and uh gray shades of gray like yeah why <laughs> you know versus why like, does it work right yes. yeah and so this um kind of leads through to um i have a year-long alternative mfa program that i've developed called workshop oh, very cool fire and the idea behind it is like, yes, I have a complete framework of craft from big picture down to, um, you know, prose, voice, all of that stuff. And also let me please teach you what I know about publishing because there's, <laughs> I didn't ever receive any education on that minor part of being a writer. Right. In, like the know, whole other 50% of your course of two degrees. Um, but also because one of the things that I think is wrong with the American MFA system, and we could have a whole hour long conversation just on this, but one of the things that I really absorbed, uh, really without anybody quite saying anything, both, I mean, through all of, through interlocking, and then also uh, graduate school. I will absent my undergraduate de degree in fiction from this because I went to a college that is very focused on social impact in the environment, right? But that stands in opposition to the other two types of like top shelf literary schooling I have received, right? Um, and that's fun because I don't think I've fully put that together until now, right? <laughs> Because when uh, I attended uh, my MFA program, there was this unspoken edict. I was trying to write about politics. Okay. I was trying to write about the environment. I was trying to write about activists because that's who I am. That's what I care about. You know, I, again, I went to this undergraduate institution that was very focused on social impact and in the environmental crisis. So of course I'm gonna write about that. And of course, I'm going to write about the people I have known and loved, right? Yeah, of course. Um, but I soon received a pretty clear message that nobody knew what to do with these types of stories I was trying to write, you know, about people grappling, you know, with uh, trying to save a local river, you know, trying to grapple with issues like what can one person do in the face of the environmental crisis? Uh, you know, what can, 
you know, what are the dynamics around um, being mixed race and how might that impact the way you operate in the world? You know, the latter really? part of my identity, yeah. that was more acceptable. That was more acceptable, right? Huh. Even, I, it's not as if it were understood, it's not as if it were received with cultural competence the way that we would hope in a workshop setting, but it was at least understood that that is a thing you can and should write about if you're a serious you know, literary writer. And why though? I couldn't figure out why you could write about this and not yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. To me, those are all political, right? right. It wasn't until I read a book um, by Eric Bennett called Workshops of Empire that I began to understand why which is that we have a legacy in this country. The first MFA programs established at Stanford and Iowa, the Iowa Writers' Workshop, were in part treated as a tool of soft power against the USSR and its propaganda. And the USSR's propaganda was all politics, all the time, all about the collective struggle and you know, yeah. very thinly veiled. There was this idea that the American aesthetic was going to be in direct opposition to that and it was going to foreground the individual, right? And, and of okay, course, so then so, if you're working as a community to save a river, so we're not going to talk about collective issues, you know, we're not going to talk about, you know, so weird, and it and exists I, to this very day, you know, it it's makes a, sense, yeah, yeah. And even if you've never heard of that, even if you never had an MFA the 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 tastes in in new york publishing are still so influenced by that idea that the only proper province of 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 literature is the evolution of the individual and i mean people hearing this who know my work i've got to be laughing because i mean a huge part of my practice is focusing on character arc right it's I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And to me, right. that's, you know, yeah. that focus on character arc is profound in its emotional impact. But who the hell is telling us that it's not okay to write about people trying yeah. to change the world or grappling with injustice and ills? If you look at the actual history of American letters, you look at Steinbeck, you look at Morrison, right. you look at... Right. Ralph Ellison, they're all grappling with so-called political issues. And in fact, the more that, you know, having a strong moral center or edge in your yes. work, it it gives the work power. Those you are know? the books you remember. Exactly. They're the ones that change us and help us find right. our way. And I find at this particular moment in history, don't we need such books yeah. I mean, yeah, it does feel a bit like American literature does. It, I don't know. There's something about I want to say watered down possibly like there are there, some books have stood out over the years. Mm -hmm. But now that you're saying this, this kind of makes sense. And I, I bet your professors don't know the why. I bet they're just like. No, I, I bet <laughs> not, you know, and, and what they would say to to that sort of work is honestly the same thing that they would say to anybody trying to write genre fiction right which yeah. is that i don't have the training to respond intelligently to this this is not what i read and this is not what i've studied so i'm not the best mentor for you on this and they wouldn't be wrong but right. look at how that perpetuates yeah and then crap. nothing gets published yeah and yeah. nothing gets broadened right Right. And, and meanwhile, those graduating from the top MFA programs, you know, still have this sort of entree, you know, let me introduce you to my editor, let me introduce you to my agent. And, you know, often they have absorbed those same edicts. Right. This is changing. And thank goodness, you know, yeah. you have people like Carmen Maria Machado, you know, who is bringing that genre she is not respecting the bounds of realism you know she it, she's blending literary and speculative fiction she's writing directly about feminism she's writing right. directly about the experience of living in a misogynistic culture like yay a yes please yeah. more of that you know 
but there are still these old walls, right? And it's like, there's still this sense. And of course you're going to absorb it as a, as a writer who wants the entree, wants right, we, the introduction. We want right? to be published. Like in the end, you can't, yeah. I mean, you think of like King Solver, she, you go back at her books and she was, she writes about always. politics and always, always, always. What is the one about the South, about the Appalachian? And I mean, it's, it's in amazing. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, or the one before that too, but it, I can't uh -huh, remember, right. remember the names of books, but I mean, but so there, of course, when you can pull out authors, you know, who have done that yeah. throughout the years, but you're right. Like in the end, we want to be published. And so if you are, if your mentor is somebody who has absorbed that, mm -hmm. then they're going to change your mm -hmm. book. Like right. Exactly. And so much self-censorship happens in that's, MFA that's program. That's it. It's the self Because you want to write what will be pleasing, right. you know, and you, right. it, it's, you wind up, yeah, I've been there, you know, and luckily right. I'm very hard headed, you know, <laughs> and, and so you developed your own. <laughs> I did, you know, and it, it was a hard, honestly, like my initial ambition to, to write about outsider characters, you know, environmental activists in sort of living at the fringes in a high literary style, that that's quite a project to pick out for your first book, you know? And so it took me a while, it took me a lot longer to publish that than I imagined that it would, you know? And and now I'm expanding more right. into full and range. Look, like once you actually, it's like anything. Once it's out there, people go, oh, well, of course. You're like, yeah, of well, y'all said no. <laughs> right, right. Or look at a book like Sunil Yappa's, you know, like often these books have a multiplicity of voices. He wrote a book mm -hmm. called Your Heart is a Muscle the Size of a Fist. It's set in the WD WTO protests of the year 2000, which is a big touch point for people in my generation involved in any kind of activism. And, you know, it's this, there is a protagonist that moves through it. But it's a kaleidoscopic narrative with all these voices. You know, it's the voice of a, right. the police officer. It's the voice of, you know, the ambassador. It's the voice of, of the the multinational corporation exec. It's like there's often, you know, breaking form. Right. You know, there's often a need to focus on more than just one individual to tell these kinds of stories. Yeah. You know, the house on Mango Street, you know, Sandra Cisneros, like, how could you tell yeah. the story of this one girl coming up in this situation on the street if you were only to tell it from her point of view, right? right? right. So let's just say that, you know, these ideas of what good craft is or what correct craft is, mm -hmm. as Matthew Celestis points out uh, in Craft in the Real World, it is always subjective, right? right so right. if it is subjective, let us base it. My, I can say this, my craft is based on some considered concerns, okay? It is based on the idea that I want you to get published, right? Mm -hmm. So I want your book to meet the expectations of the marketplace for fiction, especially right. for a debut novel, right? right because once right. you've proven yourself, you can, you do you. You can do whatever you. <laughs> right. But number two, I want you, I want your book to have a positive social impact, right? Mm. I want to help you write the version of your book that has yeah. the highest possible impact on your reader and by extension on society. That's what my craft is based on. It's okay. based on achieving those two aims. And then the how of it is based on neuroscience, right? So when we were talking about the Da Vinci Code and why it works, like in my courses, you will find out exactly right. why that works right. and how that works. Emerging you know? those together, I haven't seen before. Like that's very unique um, process for you because you can read a lot about the neuroscience and the story and all that, but the way that you focus on the writer creating the book that impacts society because I think we're all most proud of the book that impacts somebody like yeah. we all want to impact someone um, whatever that ideal reader is we want to leave a mark 
like how, you know, those are the books that we have forever on our shelves, no matter how many times we move, like those yeah. are the books that have impacted us. Right. So you now Kat, it's some people more than others. And I say that very clearly, you know, what I do is not for everyone okay. because some people just want to write the beach read, you know, they just want to write the airport. Okay. They just want to, you know, provide some entertainment and, you know, sell some books. Okay. Bless them, more power to them, you know, but based on what I'm hearing from you, we're the same kind of people, yeah. right? Which is that we won't want to do more than that. We don't want to just write, want to write a good book. We want to write a great book, you know, right, right, right. and Jenny Nash calls this like the 3 a.m. friend, you know, you have the friends that are like, oh yeah, you see them at the parties, you have some small talk or whatever, but then there's the friend that you you call at 3 a.m. when you're losing your mind, right? And she her analogy is that books are like that, yeah, you know? That's true. We all have that book we reach for, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, so like I, I want to help people write 3 a.m. versions of their books, you know? That's and, wonderful. And there's so, I get plenty of blowback for this, right? Okay. Because there are so many people, they're often men, I have a, an occasional series on my newsletter called Men on the Internet Being Wrong, which <laughs> is the gift that just keeps on giving, let me tell you. Yeah, you won't ever be lacking. <laughs> you know, any time that I talk about um, writing the, the power of fiction that has a social impact or the power of engaging with issues in your work, I get some dude saying, Inter having a message Having something you're trying to say immediately means that it's going to be bad art. Having any way that you're trying to write politics is going to result in didactic, you know, caca propaganda with no depth or artistry to it. And I mean, even as recently as just a couple of weeks ago, like this, like uh, it's an article on The Atlantic, the, the problem with political art right? I think so this is accurate. George Packer, uh, you know, talking about this. And I just don't agree. Well, yeah, imagine if Jane don't. Austen listened to the men in her life, we wouldn't have, you know, that's so crazy. Well, you know, like you said, and, and these things giving. can be foregrounded in your work yeah, or they can be backgrounded. You know, yeah. I'm saying everybody's got to write about some issue, right? But even my mother who writes like, cozy mysteries you know there's there's a gay character in her town you know which is based on my town which has this kind of subversive you know social impact just by representing the fact that people gay people exist in rural places right <laughs> and in small towns as well as big cities right you know that they are you know, by her characterization shows that they are people just like everybody else. They're not characters who are characterized exclusively by their gayness, right? Right, right. You know, and it's just this subtle way that she takes a stand in her work for what she believes in. And those subtle things do have an impact on the world. Absolutely. And we're living in a time now of book bans, right? Which you know, sometimes people are like, well, why do you want to help people write these sorts of books when these are the very sorts of books that are being banned? It's like, well, why do you think they're being banned? Right, right. Absolutely. It's Absolutely. because they're powerful, right? Um, so anyways, again, that could be a whole conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so you are looking for for writers who want to merge those two, basically. I you do, created yeah. this system called Workshops Against Empire. Um, which as this goes out is launching, um, in, I guess, depending on when they're listening to this, but this will go out, um, this is the end of January. So it's launching soon. So yeah. tell us, um, we know the kind of writer you're looking for somebody who's willing, to, like wants to make an impact with their writing, but wants to learn the why behind the storytelling and all, um, but do you want to tell us a little bit more about the membership and then how people can, um, find you. I'll have a link um, to your website, but how they can like find out more about you and how they can um, join. 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, workshops against empire, there's two ways to do it. Um, one is uh, to join a year long membership that is um, self paced through five courses. So those courses are anatomy of a novel, which is my guide to big picture storytelling. Um, and uh, let's just say a, a novel approach to plot that has produced big impact on a lot of people and is very tested over a long period of time. And uh, even pantsers, even pantsers love it, people. <laughs> good, good, good. <laughs> I tell was... people, I'm a natural pantser, but the truth is life gets in the way. And if you're trying to write a novel, you got to figure out a way to put the yeah, ideas down. A dozen island. I don't know. Um, but, you know, that process works even for people who have to do a discovery draft to even know their story. Right, you're right, right. going to plan it on the front end or you're going to plan it when you're headed yeah. into your second draft. And sure. this is a process that works really well across That's genre cool. for so many people. The second course is being seen. And this is the guide to using scenes in your story in a really powerful way. This is not something I learned in grad school. Um, and it, it, I think it's a really important distinct, it's important skill set to get a hold of. If you want to bring your story to life mm -hmm. in your reader's mind, along with his conflicts and characters in a really vivid way, because neuroscience, right? So that's being seen and it's a guide, not only to how to write powerful scenes, but how to use scene in your novel, right, um, right. scene and summary. Um, then voice and vision is a guide to what we're getting into when we go into hopefully a third draft, which is tightening down the language. So that's, that's where I get into point of view, right? And okay. close point of view and why we want that, why we crave that, and why it's necessary for getting a reader sucked into your story. How to really develop a you know, distinct voice mm -hmm. for your character and for your writing, right? How, how, how to make your characters the writing itself, the character comes through that, sure. which is the number one things that gets the agents or editors attention. Of course. And all the way, all the way through to how to thread in backstory, because I consider that a subset of point of view. So again, yes. it's a different way of looking at things, right? It's through from the big picture to the medium picture right. to the prose itself, right. which is the most efficient way to work on a, a draft of a novel, right? Is via multiple drafts focusing right. on two different things. And then the final one, story medicine, that is where we really look at bringing what it takes to bring the story from good to great by okay. creating great, greater sense of depth, more powerful emotions, more complex characterization, especially in the antagonists. Mm. right? Because a lot of the, the social impact of your story has, you know, a lot lies behind how you are dealing with the people doing wrong in the right. story, a lot of complexity. Right. Right. And right. then, you know, also how to avoid uh, negatively impacting, you know, people from historically marginalized groups with right. your story and your characters, thereby uh, avoiding post-publication nightmares, right? Yes. So consider that the final stage of the process is is deepening those effects and really focusing the social impact. And then the final course, final draft is about all about the publishing, you know, from your query right. letter, to your synopsis to how to find agents and editors, how to navigate the current publishing landscape. You know, yeah. a lot of people think it's just self-publishing or the big four. <laughs> that is really not true at all. Oh, yeah. Right. And it's also about thinking about your longer career trajectory as a writer oh, and right. being kind of smart in the way that you are pitching your first book based on where you okay. want to end up. Um, oh, so those are yes. five self-paced courses that you I get like access this. to when you join. Okay. Um, and you also get a year long, you get year long access to those courses. You get year long access to my online writer's uh, community, the story medicine oh, community. Wonderful. And then That's there's amazing. live classes each month with that. Okay. Okay. That's yeah. a lot. That's, that's a lot. That is, I know. And I probably, 
so, you know, no, I'm very serious, yeah. If you're serious about writing a book and you know, it's yeah. January, like this is the perfect time. We all have those goals. Like this year, I'm going to write the novel, you know, mm. um, I mean, this is a perfect way to just like have a process because when I work with clients, sometimes I work with mostly nonfiction, but it's, it's like mm -hmm. having a process yeah. will help all the little like stressors in your head, just relax. Right. Yeah. And that sounds like yeah. a wonderful process, honestly. And again, this process is based on a lot of experience yes. in terms of the most efficient way to work, the skills, you know, it's designed to teach you all the skills that you need, the core skills right. you need as a novelist, um, as you write or revise yeah. a book. And that, to me, that's a clever bit. You know? Yes. <laughs> yes, because that's the place where you go insane. And yeah. a lot of us go, well, why am I even writing this? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You need that community to be like, no, just, you know. Plus, I, I think your process as well um, could avoid the being bogged down, you know, where like if you're, because you're self editing all the time, right? Like, I don't even know the like, saying first draft versus third draft, like constant, you're constantly like revising, right? But you can get so bogged down in the is that sentence right when what you're saying is like you're in phase one here you're in phase one don't worry <laughs> about that then. don't worry about that exactly. like you can say just five thousand times don't worry about it we'll get rid of that in the next phase right yeah yeah and and that's a really powerful community too at this mm -hmm. point that i've built that that's i'm very wonderful. proud of you know because we all you know, we all need people. This yes. is such like a, a process. It can feel so lonely. Yeah. You know? And I personally too, I don't, I don't want to sign up for any course that's self-paced where I can't ask questions. Right. You right. know, and specifically about how this thing applies to my specific circumstance. That right. is so much where like craft books fall short, right? We yes. read the book and we get so excited you know, we might even understand the framework, although often craft books don't really have a framework. They have an yeah. approach, not a framework. Right. They have a real why, um, other than like, this is what's worked for me and I'm a famous writer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. but, but then that excitement dies down as you try to actually apply it to yes. your own weird, beautiful, special unicorn of a yeah. book. Right. I think being able to yeah. to ask questions and and get feedback from the person who wrote the thing or made right. the system that's really important too. Or the students who have applied it because you get that. Wait, what? Yeah. And th that moment you can go to the community and say, okay, somebody absolutely. Me. <laughs> so that and is I, you know powerful. I offer a free masterclass every month, and that's my service to the community. Like everybody can can yeah come to that. I believe at the time you'll release this episode, I'll be offering one of these free masterclasses about a, a week or two after it's released. Um, and and that will be called, maybe it's not your plot, which is one of my nice. favorite uh, titles or presentations that I, I've given because I offered it first for Jane Friedman because so many people are just, tie themselves in knots over this thing called plot. And to me, that's yeah. not even the most efficient or logical place to start. Okay. Right? So this is basically an introduction to my big picture approach to storytelling that's contained in anatomy of the novel, which is in this larger program. Right. But the point here is that I offer these master classes as a service to the community and they're always absolutely free. But I only um, make the replays of those classes each month available to the people in my membership. Right. Okay. So that's just a, a built in extra perk, you know, that people yeah. get. I find that live event and, and what we share around it, that's part of what makes the community special Absolutely. because those people who see what I offer in the master classes, they understand the framework that it connects to. Yeah. Right. So for them, it's like I'm explicating something that they've learned in these courses in a deeper way. And Absolutely. I really like the synergy between those things. Yeah. I, I'm a learner who needs, I will go back and re-listen and 
I want to hear you say it in a different way. And I will always be that one to sign up and be like, because you'll always learn something new. Like our writing okay. process is an evolution. You're going to constant. I want my goal is for every book to be a little bit better. Yeah. Right. Like, <laughs> so I, I also think for this membership, it's it's people who are like minded in how they want to approach their writing as well. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's very special um, for your membership because yes. you yeah. It's important to have a community that you can really relate to. And so if you're looking to merge that storytelling with social impact, with your writing, like this is this workshop against empires is definitely the membership for you, for the writers listening. So we are going to release this on um, January 22nd or a few days after if you're listening and um, you will, we will have the links in the show notes so that they can go and attend your live workshop after hearing this and they can see that. And um, with that link, will they also get more information that will be where they can find out more information about Absolutely. joining? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. They'll get more information. Um, and, you know, if they just want to check it out, um, even without attending that live event, it's, it's online at workshopsagainstempire.com. Wonderful. We will have those links in the show notes. So everyone go click on them, find out more about Susan. It's been so lovely to talk to you. I think we could probably talk for like three more hours. Yes. <laughs> we'll just have to have, have you back on. Yes. <laughs> so thank you so much, Susan. Thank you so much, Kat.